Well, this morning we are going to seek to explain the main truths of what the Bible teaches as to how we can be put right with God through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The history of our earth and uh, the Bible begins with our first parents, Adam and Eve, in a paradise called Eden. That's interesting if you look at uh, the population of this earth and uh, you look at uh, it with regard to numbers. The numbers agree quite clearly with the idea that the earth and the population of the earth is relatively young and is not millions of years old because if it were so there would be far more people on the earth than there are. The actual figures of the population agree with an earth which is roughly about 6,000 years old. Also we can look at uh, mitochondrial studies uh, where people look at uh, the mitochondria in our cells, won't go into what they are, but uh, again they've shown that everyone comes from, it seems, the ancestry of one woman. All these things uh, confirm the scriptures and we know that at the moment many are finding it hard because they can't necessarily jet off to various uh, lovely uh, locations as they would have done so last year because of the restrictions that we're under. Many who go away, they look for places, no doubt, which would have been very similar to the Garden of Eden, places which are sort of like paradises. And Eden would have been the most wonderful of places. This would have been a place which would have far exceeded any holiday brochures. It was a perfect place. Uh, the sights, the sounds, the satisfaction and security that Adam and Eve would have enjoyed would have far exceeded any modern day tourist spot, even places like the Maldives or Mali or Tahiti or anywhere where anyone could go, which they think is, is wonderful. But in the end, we know that Adam and Eve were put out of this paradise of Eden. Paradise has gone. But is there another paradise, another place where perfect fellowship with God is enjoyed and sin no longer has any influence? Well, the Bible says that there is. Uh, with all the uncertainty of today, with the threat due to the coronavirus, the Bible constantly points us to a greater security and a greater hope that isn't temporary, isn't just for this life, but is eternal. So our title this morning is this, Searching for Paradise. Searching for bar Paradise. Turn to that reading that we had, uh, those readings we had from Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. We know many are looking to find, especially, especially today, uh, some form of paradise. Is there such a place? Well, we're going to have four points this morning. We're going to see, firstly, paradise lost. Secondly, paradise sought. Thirdly, paradise is unobtainable. And fourthly, paradise regained. Well, firstly, paradise lost. Now, God put our first parents, Adam and Eve, in a garden, the paradise of the Garden of Eden. At this time, we know that so many are enjoying their gardens, especially at times of lockdown, or perhaps if they've just got a few pots, they're uh, enjoying the things they can grow in those. And there's something exceptional, exceptional about a garden. We know that the National Trust, uh, its gardens are visited by millions. People love to go and see these wonderful gardens. Why is that? Why is there so many gardening programmes which revel in uh, gardens and what we can do with them? Well, you see, God first put us in a garden and it's where he originally intended we should be. And so gardens, in some ways, you see, ring a bell with us as to our origin and as to our first home. And God was so kind, God was so rich, God was so lavish in the provision that he made for Adam and Eve. We live in a fallen world and even the natural world has been affected by uh, sin and uh, the curse and yet we still marvel at its beauties and its glories, the things that we see in this world. And so we're caused all the more to think, what would have Eden have been like? Eden would have been so much more wonderful, even in the world we see around us. Adam and Eve, I know, I've got no doubt, would have seen sunsets that were breathtaking. 
and uh, the birds sang and the animals called to each other and uh, there were all these wonderful flowers and trees that gave all these wonderful colours and displays which even a thousand Exbury Gardens uh, couldn't uh, rival. Uh, the fruits of the trees grew in abundance and satisfied their hunger, uh, no doubt with a sweetness and a succulence that even uh, Waitrose finest couldn't uh, come near. The air was warm and fresh. There was no extremes of temperature, nothing to pollute their environment. There was no violence. Even the animals lived in harmony with one another. But chief, you see, chief among the delights of the garden for Adam and Eve was the fact that their God was their close companion and their friend. This was the chief thing about Eden. It was such a wonderful place because God was there and sin wasn't there. Adam and Eve enjoyed this unhindered fellowship with God because they were perfect beings. Day after day, they loved God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. They enjoyed his holy presence. They enjoyed his closeness. They enjoyed his care. And you see, God had provided all these things for them. He'd held nothing back. And he'd given them this abundance of good things. He'd given them his fellowship, his presence with them as well. There was only one restriction that God placed upon man. There was one tree that their friend, their maker and their God had asked them not to eat, the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. And so you see, there were Adam and Eve, they're in this state of sinless perfection, enjoying God, enjoying each other, enjoying the creation. What a wonderful situation it was. And yet, tragically, it's all going to change. Adam and Eve do the most terrible thing. They commit the most terrible wickedness. They're subtly drawn away and tempted by God's enemy, the devil. And he actually convinces them to believe certain things about God. They are convinced by the devil to doubt God's power, that he's a God who does not have the ability to do what he says. He convinces Adam and Eve to doubt God's goodness, to believe that somehow this God who's given them all these things doesn't really care for them, and he's keeping something back from them which should really be theirs. And then he causes them to doubt God's wisdom, that they could know better than God. They could actually, as it were, think that they knew better than God, that their way would be better than God's way. And so they take of the fruit they've been told not to eat, and they eat. And the Bible says that as a result of Adam's sin now, of course, we share. We've inherited this attitude that they had towards God. Isn't it clear that the Bible is true when we see the way men and women act today? People doubt God's power. Oh, they say, who cares about a day of judgment? We don't need to fear God. And anyway, shouldn't we have all that we want? even if sometimes it's clearly sin and goes against God's laws. You see, they doubt God's goodness in the way that God has provided for us, and they think that there's something they should have which goes beyond God's law and what God has said is right. And they doubt God's wisdom. We know better than God. We know what's best. Who is God to deny us having these things? Well, having been deceived by God's enemy, Adam and Eve, as we say, they eat that which they shouldn't have done, the forbidden fruit. Now, what is the result? Well, the consequences are not what Adam and Eve imagined they would be. Adam and Eve find that they are now fallen. They are under the power and the guilt of sin. And what's worse, their fellowship with a holy God is now ruined because, you see, they're defiled by sin. They are no longer those perfect creatures they once were. They are now sinners under the power of sin and the guilt of sin. And they have these feelings of guilt and of shame. And the thought of coming to God now and entering his presence and having fellowship with God is something which now repels them. They want to be away from God. And you witness this all the time, don't you? You could be talking to somebody about any subject. And yet if you bring up God and the Lord Jesus Christ, immediately they're, they're on the back foot. We find that so often they, they don't want to know. There's this 
opposition towards God. There's this desire to be away from God. It's because we're Adam and Eve's offspring and we share the same nature that they receive themselves, that fallen nature. And you see, all of us naturally, we prefer to be away from God. We prefer to hide from God rather than come to God. But wonderfully, God in his great mercy and grace, though he could have judged them there and then in, in, in his mercy, he comes to Adam and Eve and he confronts them with their sin, yes. He not only tells them of the consequences of their sin, but wonderfully, he now tells them how he will provide a deliverer. He will provide a saviour, one who will come and overturn the works of the devil and release men and women from the guilt and the power of sin. He will give Satan a death blow, but he'll be wounded himself in so doing. God is speaking there of, of the work of the Lord Jesus. He's looking forward to it. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary, where he will suffer and die, and yet he will overturn the works of the devil. But notice there's another consequence, another consequence of their sin. Verse 22, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Now there in those verses, we read of the Trinitarian God, the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They consult amongst themselves and they see Adam and Eve have decided to act against God and independently of God. The devil said, you'll be like God, and yet it was a deceit, it was a lie. In taking the fruit, Adam and Eve, if you like, had become like God briefly, in that they had decided to take a course where they would obey themselves and not obey a higher authority, the authority of God which was over them. It sort of enabled them to briefly act like God, as it were, because God has no authority over him. He's the highest authority. But now it's brought them under God's curse. It was a deceit. It was a lie. But what is worse, it has put them out. It's meant that they are now put out of the presence of God. There in the garden. You see, in the garden there was the tree of life. What was the tree of life? Well, the tree of life seemed to symbolise the fullness of the life that they enjoyed with God. It was in God's presence that they would know this fullness of life, that the symbol of the tree of life showed them or, or actually gave to them. But you see, their sin and their disobedience has now severed that relationship with God. No longer can they take of that tree, no longer can they enjoy the fullness of life that they once would have known, the relationship they had with a holy God. And no longer can they be and enjoy God's presence. They can't be in that presence anymore. This is what sin has done. This is what their sin has done. You see, that garden was a paradise, a place where God specially met with man. It was a holy sanctuary where God was present in all his wonderful life-giving power, none, nothing sinful, nothing unclean could live in that place, could stay in that place. And now God cannot have sinners dwelling with him. Nothing sinful unclean or unclean can be with him. And so they're put out of that place where God especially dwelt. They're expelled from the presence of this holy and this sinless God. Verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. They're driven out, they're expelled from the garden. This is what sin has done. This is where we all are as sinners. This is where we all are naturally. We're out of paradise. We're out of the presence of a holy and a glorious God. Our sins have separated us from this God. And so you see, paradise is lost. That paradise they had there, which was so wonderful, in which they enjoyed communion with God and the presence of God in this wonderful way, that's been lost. But you know, there was once a person who suffered a blow to the head. They got concussed. And they forgot nearly everything. 
But there was one thing they never forgot, and that was where they'd come from, where their home was. And you know, it's the same with man. Right from the beginning and throughout the history of this world, we see in the heart of every man and woman, there's a longing to return to that place where we came from, longing to return to that life of paradise which we've been put out from. So having seen paradise lost, secondly, paradise sought. Now throughout man's history, we find men and women searching or striving to create a paradise. Straight after the fall in Genesis 4, we read of Cain wanting to build an elaborate, secure, sophisticated society. Why did he do it? Well, could it be that the memory in man's mind of Eden, uh, Cain wanted his own paradise. And if we look further in history, we find throughout history there is this dream of regaining paradise. It's found everywhere, right from the ancient Greek writings under Plato, Plato's Republic, H.G. Uh, Wells in the Victorian era, a modern utopia, another name for a perfect society. These men, they wrote, they dreamed of how we could return to paradise. It's the hope of the great social reformers in our own land who developed the welfare state, the aim of giving a good life to all without poverty, uh, with education, with health and with happiness. It was the dream of the disasters of communism and of the French Revolution. We will build societies that are for the benefit and for the good of all and not just for the privileged, all men are equal. But then their cry eventually became that more men were equal than others. Sorry, yeah, that there were some more equal than others, as it were. I think of the various treks that people have made across continents, uh, the Mormons, other religious communities, going looking for their own sort of Xanadus, their places where they could establish communes. We think of the monasteries, the convents, uh, even the cults where people say, well, this is the place we can find true serenity and peace. Uh, the Muslims who believe if only Sharia law was imposed everywhere, their version of Eden would soon appear. We can think of the imagining of science fiction, of Star Trek and Star Wars, of distant worlds of the paradises, the imagining of John Le Lennon. Today's dream is still alive, isn't it? In those who seek to escape from the country. Oh, escape to the country, and well here, you know, there'll be no noisy neighbours, none of the nastiness and pollution that you find in the cities, none of the crime. It'll be like a paradise. Think of the politicians who assure us under them society will only continue to improve. And they say, well, we'll strive to ensure that all the features we left behind in Eden, health and wealth and security, peace, contentment, long life, and eventually freedom from the virus, all are going to be conquered. And so we could go on, you see. Man dreams, doesn't he, of regaining paradise. And we find it everywhere. Man wants to return to paradise. But the problem is, you see, with all these philosophies, all these politicians, all these religious followers, they will never have paradise. They'll never find it. Why is that? Well, because, you see, they want and they believe we can have a paradise, an Eden, without God. And where they do not need to address the chief problem which is the problem of sin. Do you know all man's strivings for a new and a godless, a sin-tolerating Eden is futile. He can never find it, and he will never have it. Why is that? Well, thirdly, our third point, it's because, thirdly, paradise is unobtainable. Paradise is unobtainable. You see, when man enters any paradise, he eventually spoils it because he cannot change what is in his heart. He cannot change his nature. Jesus tells us, where is it that all the violence and the wickedness that we find in societies come from? Well, Jesus tells us, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. We can think of places have such potential, wonderful, vast resources and beauty. And yet time after time, we find that eventually there's so much crime and so much wickedness. Apparently Tahiti was a paradise. 
And yet, eventually, it was a place which was notorious for murder and cannibalism. You see, the dreams of an earthly paradise can never come true because man of himself cannot return to that paradise. Because, you see, the very one who walks in that paradise is the very one who spoils it because of the sin that is in his heart. And you see, when God put Adam and Eve out of Eden, he put them out of his presence. And so really, you see, as sinners, we are barred. We cannot return as we are into the presence of that holy God who is the one who makes paradise paradise. And the way is blocked, the way is barred. We read that in verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The way you see back to God is barred, is closed off. Of ourselves, we cannot come to God as our, of ourselves. We cannot return to paradise. We can't enter into the presence of a holy God, the one who made paradise, paradise. Forever there is this flaming sword that we read of there in Genesis 3, verse 24, which is barring the way and which will prevent us if we were to try to come back of ourselves into the presence of God to try and seek after that paradise that is found only with God and through God. And you see, the Bible says God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day, the flaming sword of God's holy justice and God's anger against our sin, it blocks our way into God's presence. That flaming sword that the cherubim held there in Genesis 3, flashing backwards and forwards, guarding the way into the presence of God, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that between us and God, there is now this barrier, the barrier of his holy justice and his anger against sin against our sin. And so you see, preventing me from coming into God's presence and knowing him is the very real fact that he has this holy nature which is repelled by sin and he cannot tolerate sin. And the Bible says that we're alienated from God. Our iniquities have separated us from God. And you see, there is no way back to God. There's no way round his justice He's a holy God, and so his justice must be addressed. His, his anger towards sin must be dealt with. He can't just ignore it. He's a good God. He's a holy God. And so, you see, his justice towards my sin, which that flaming sword symbolizes, must be dealt with if I am to return unto God and know peace with God. But who can take, who can face the anger of God's wrath? and his justice. Who can do battle with that sword of God's justice, his anger towards sin? Who can do that and win? None of us can. None of us can get past the sword of God's justice. Whoever overcomes it must not draw its blows, you see. They must be without sin. The one who deals with the sword of God's justice must himself be sinless, lest it attack him. And none of us are. So if there is no one of us who can face the sword of God's justice and, and live, we all deserve God's justice. How can it be dealt with? Well, fourthly, fourthly, paradise restored. Paradise restored. Now, there was a day some 2,000 years ago when the world experienced a strange thing. It experienced darkness at noon, at midday this great darkness. And at the centre of that darkness was God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, hanging there on the cross at Calvary. And as we look through the gloom, although we couldn't have seen him, but we're told in the Word of God, he knew terrible agonies. And we realise his agonies were far greater than the agonies of the other two thieves who were suffering crucifixion as well. And he cried extraordinary things. He cried, I thirst. He cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see a sorrow, we see a devastation and an anguish which others have never known there in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was there this darkness? Why was there this cry? 
I don't know if you've ever seen a blacksmith take a piece of metal and heat it and heat it and heat it until it goes red hot and then it goes white hot and then he plunges it in water and it is quenched and there's this great sound of the hissing as the uh, heat is dissipated and the steam comes away from it and it's cooled. We see this glorious God out of love for sinners, out of great love for sinners. He's taken his son to the cross, his sinless son, and he has gladly gone there out of love for sinners. And there God has taken that sword, that flaming sword of his justice that we read of there in Genesis, which will come at any who seek to enter the presence of God as they are. And he's taken that sword and it's white hot. It's white hot in its justice against the sin of sinners. It's inflamed, you see, that sword by our lust, by our cursing, by our theft, by our blasphemy, by our ingratitude towards God, our unthankfulness, our self-seeking, our jealousy, our adultery, our murder. And in mercy and love, rather than allowing that just sword to go to war against sinners, as it were, and to slay them, he's taken it and he's plunged it into the heart of the son of his love. And there it has been quenched. The prophet Zechariah, some 550 years before Jesus lived, told how God's sword would fall upon Jesus. And he said, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and you see christ bore in his own body the wound the blow of that flaming sword of god's justice in his anger against sin and he quenched it at calvary he dealt with all the guilt all that was against us there at calvary for all who will believe upon him for sinners the sword which barred the way back into God's presence, the sword of God's flaming anger and his justice towards sin, it was quenched. It was silenced through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see, all who look to Christ and trust in him can know that that sword sleeps. That sword has been dealt with, never to awaken again against them. What's amazing is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, Inside the city there was the temple of God, the temple, and there was a very high curtain, several metres high, and it separated the priests and others from the very presence of God. They were reminded that the way to God's presence was barred for sinners. The curtain showed them there was no way through into the presence of God. But it's an amazing thing that that curtain, which had the same cherubim upon it, which we read of here in Genesis, the same cherubim were embroidered on that curtain to show that there was no way back to God, no way back to paradise, the paradise that is found in the presence of God as we are, without our sin being dealt with. Amazingly, as Christ died on that cross, and he cried, it is finished, knowing that his great work of quenching the sword of God's justice, dealing with the sin of all who will believe upon him, was complete. That veil, that curtain was torn in two. Not from the bottom to the top, lest anyone should think a man tore it, but from the top to the bottom, to show it was God's doing. God had made a way whereby our sin can be dealt with, can be fully that which receives the justice of God and yet make a way whereby now we can be forgiven of God and accepted of God and know that that which blocked the way into God's presence has been taken away, has been removed. There is now the open way into the presence of God by the new and living way which Christ has made open to us. You see, Christ truly brings us to God. God has raised him to show the acceptance of his work, though he died. And it's a wonderful thing. If I am his, if I truly know Jesus as my saviour, in some ways, you know, I'm already back in paradise. 
Already paradise in some ways is being restored in part. I already have one foot in heaven. Already, if you like, I've already passed the gates to a degree of heaven because, you see, I enjoy fellowship with God in prayer. The presence of God. Fellowship with God. I know something of this as a Christian. It's a real experience. Paradise has been restored to some degree. I'm still in a fallen world. I still suffer illness, sorrow and trial and rejection. Yet I truly have fellowship with God. Fellowship has been restored. That fellowship which Adam and Eve enjoyed has been restored. I have the delight which Eden gave. God's love, God's companionship, God's presence with me. Though I'm still in this fallen world in some ways, I'm one who knows what it is to have a taste of paradise. To be in part back in paradise because I know this fellowship with the true and living God. See, men and women seek after a paradise in this world, but they won't have it. It's a false dream. It's sport by man's sinfulness. And yet one day, if I'm a Christian, I will be truly in paradise again. A greater paradise than all Eden could ever have given or this world could give. How is it described? It's described in Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. There, in that wonderful paradise, that paradise which is restored, which is far greater than the paradise that Eden was, and a paradise that can never be lost through the work of Christ, because I have been cleansed of my sins, because the requirements of God's law and God's holy character have been met by the Lord Jesus. He has taken the punishment. He's dealt with that flaming sword of God's justice which was towards me. Because of that, I can now enter in fully on that day into that paradise that God has prepared for all who love him. I've got a foretaste of it now. In some ways, I'm already in it now. I've got a foot in it now because I enjoy fellowship with God now. But on that day, I'll enjoy it in all its fullness Paradise will be restored. It can't be found anywhere on this sinful earth. But it will be found on that day, in that new heavens and that new earth wherein righteousness dwells. Friend, can I ask, in this uncertain day, do you have this hope? Do you have this wonderful promise, this certainty? Do you know that if you left this life, or if Christ comes again and you're called into God's presence to stand before him, you'd have no fear because you're reconciled to him now. You know the Son of God has dealt with your sin and your guilt. He's taken it away because of the great work that he has done on the cross. And you're looking to him and you know him as your saviour. So the Christian knows that even if they got this virus, even if they went down with the virus tomorrow, they know that whatever would happen, in the end, all is well, because they know they have eternal life. They have the love of God, and it can never be taken from them. They're assured that one day they will be with God in this paradise, which nothing in this world compares with. Why are they assured of that? Why do they have it? Well, they know God's love now. They have an experience of God's love now. They know that for them, Christ has dealt with that sword of God's justice. He's dealt with the anger of God, which barred their way to God. And they know God's fellowship and God's love now. Do you know our greatest need? Our greatest need at this time is not necessarily to make sure we avoid the virus. My greatest need is to know that I have peace with God. And that I am right with God. Do you know this? Do you know God? Do you know God's love? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God has done this great work. Christ has come in fulfillment of that word given even way back then, given by God, assuring that there would be this one who would destroy the devil's works, 
Though himself he was wounded, he's come, he's done that work. He's risen from the dead, he's victorious. He's done this great work. Now wonderful it is if we are those who trust in him and look to him and know his salvation and know what it is to be put right with God. May we see our greatest need at this time is not safety from the virus, though we'll do all that we can, of course, to be wise in seeking to be safe, but our greatest need is the need of peace with God and to need to know that we the need to know that we're reconciled to God and we're put right with God through the work which Christ has done may it be our experience and may we all have come to this God and come to this Savior before it is too late and know the peace that only he can give and the promise of life eternal and of being forever in that paradise with God in the end where we can enjoy his fellowship and his love and his presence forever. May God so grant it that every one of us knows this. For his name's sake we pray. Amen.